Claire Mann is a vegan psychologist, communications trainer and author. She's, she's the author of Vistopia, The Anguish of Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World, and works with individuals and animal protection agencies all over the world to help them be part of the solution of bringing about a vegan world. In today's workshop, Claire will be discussing the concept of and how to practically cope when living with dystopia. I've had the pleasure of meeting Claire recently. She's got amazing value to share. So uh, please make welcome Claire Mann. Thank you. Thank you so much and thanks for being here. And um, what an amazing festival this is, really. It's the largest one that uh, Western Australia has seen. Uh, and it's wonderful. I thought I was going to be standing up there and I was going to say, as beautiful as this building is, that just represents everything that's wrong with our society, doesn't it? I'll stand up there and I'll just, you know, uh, whatever. So I'm so glad I'm able to be down here. So, um, look, we've got two hours and, and in preparing this, I thought, well, I know I've spoken in Perth before, so I thought, well, what happens if no one's been to my talks before and there'll be some valuable stuff I probably would, you know, like to share with you. At the same time, if people have been to events before, we don't want a complete repeat. Okay, so who, who, who came to the Perth AV talk I gave last year? Excellent. Oh, good. I could have just taken the last presentation. No. <laughs> no, that's right. There'll be some, um, we'll move a little quicker on some of the stuff we've done. But people haven't. Excellent. Lovely. So look, we've got two hours. It's a long time to be sitting. Um, I would love it that we were all in a great big circle. I'm not going to talk for two hours. Uh, it's going to go with the flow. I've got some exercises where I get people to talk, go inside, to talk to other people, to look at your experiences. Um, and we're happy to go with the flow as well, you know, what we need to leave, you know, this room living in a non-vegan world. Okay. Now, is there anyone who doesn't know what this soap here is? Excellent. Lovely. Okay. Is most other people know it? Okay. Um, anybody, the people that know what it is, and I'll explain in a moment. Um, do people suffer from that or is it just me? Suffer from this soap, the anguish of being a vegan in a non-vegan world. Absolutely. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just quickly share the concept um, and the three different elements of that is to also then really look at solutions. What can we do internally to align our conscious and unconscious and unconscious intentions? What can we do when there's a lot of anxiety and grief? You know, some people go undercover, some people are standing on the street advocating, others are trying to be in the workplace, talking to colleagues who say, oh, it's, it's not my problem. How do we deal with all those emotional reactions? Okay, and then how do we deal with family? When they actually say, oh, don't tell me what to do, you're preachy, um, the government would never allow it, it wasn't that bad, all this sort of stuff, we have to deal with them. We go to work and they're doing Melbourne Cup and they do a sweepstake and all this layer upon layer upon layer. Okay? But then the bigger issue, because once you start opening your eyes, as you know, there is a bigger issue here and everything you've been told is absolutely a pack of lies. And everyone calls you a conspiracy theorist. So we've got this whole problem going on. We'll look at those three elements and I'll be looking at specific solutions that I've used in my own life and in my own practice as a psychologist. Uh, but also drawing on experiences of other people and some really cool stuff of what's happening um, on the global scene generally around um, showing us scientifically, if we want that as a, a marker of, um, to say it's okay, <laughs> is that thoughts really are things. And so it doesn't just make us feel all warm and fuzzy when we visualize that vegan world. We're actually ushering it in, which is what's happening at the moment. It's exponential what's happening. All right? Okay. Um, I'll do some practical stuff. I want to end with a meditation. Um, but I want you to constantly think at the moment, you know, what are the issues I'm facing? What help could I need when I go into pairs or we go into small groups? Let's, uh, let's go with the flow. Should we have a five minute break? It, um, literally not to leave or maybe for a comfort break. At about halfway through? Yeah, we stand up, hug each other or one order around or something. It just refreshes so that it's a long time to sort of be here. Fantastic. Okay, well thank you for coming. All right, I'll have to think up some forces. Okay, so Vistopia. Um, I mentioned that I was a psychologist, or at least I'm a recovering one. <laughs> I, um, I've been a psychologist for 30 years, and I don't know if people know my story. I, I probably would like to share. We all like to know how people became vegan, usually. Um, 40 years ago, I read a book by Bob Geldof. 
Now we've got some musicians here. Who knows who Bob Geldof is? Who doesn't know who he is? Who's making me feel incredibly up? You don't know. Oh, come on. Okay. Now, you go through, if you, if you go through a shopping mall at that time, people call Christmas, and you walk through the shopping mall and you hear that song, and so this is Christmas. Okay? And so this, I can sing it if you like. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah? That was the subject of Live Aid, which was when back in the, gosh, when would it be? Um, early, late 70s? Sorry? Yeah. Early, early 80s, when a group of people got together, formed a band under Bob Geldof of the Boomtown Rats, Tell Me Why I Don't Like Mondays. Okay, that was his, one of his songs in 1979. And he put together a group of musicians who donated their time to make an album called So This Is Christmas to raise money for the starving in Africa because of this drought at the time. It's now gone year after year and we hear it. But not many people know that he wrote a sort of autobiography at a very young age, Bob did. And he used to work in an abattoir in Dublin. And in that book, he started to tell me about the experiences when he worked there. And I was reading his book, it's called Isn't That It? 1979, I was in my late teens. And he, as he was um, writing about that, I'm telling you now, I won't go through the details, we all know the, the, the situation. I can see what was happening to a particular cow from the moment that cow was taken into you know, the, the ending murder of their lives. Okay? It was in that moment that I gave up meat. Doesn't make me any stronger or better than anyone else, but I was so affected by that to think, how didn't I know this? It's baffled me that I then became a vegetarian, and for the next 30 years, I'm gonna to continue to eat eggs, the reproductive secretions of other species, and thank goodness, um, I had eczema, and I wasn't able to eat dairy. I thought I was allergic to dairy, but then somebody told me I wasn't a calf. Quite a surprise, because humans, as you may think, that's right. I love it when people say that, don't you? I'm dairy intolerant. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. You just love a bow one. <laughs> okay, but that's, it wasn't until 10 years ago, and I was, my partner and I were living in New Zealand, and we came across pig dogging. No one over there is pig, pig, um, pig dog. What's it called over there? It's not pig, but it's pig dogging. Okay. Um, and one night I heard this terrible howling um, on a place we found in paradise in the south of the island, with a little eco house, um, this awful howling. And of course, people in this room, I'm sure, we don't look the other way, we have to go and investigate. And it was animal dogs that had come back after a hunt. And I remember, I'm not here to traumatize people, but I remember holding my hands through the bars of a dog that was partly a ferocious dog that went out hunting holding his little face, he'd been scored by a pig, thrown back in the cage, minus seven degrees, couldn't get his paws into there. Okay, now the horror of that, of course, is so awful, however, it served, and this is the bigger picture we sometimes need to look at, to bring forward my compassion, to say this can't just be here. I had all the dogs taken away, you can imagine, they clean the prison camps up, they bring them back, and then we start to look further. I then looked into dairy, and right on my doorstep, I experienced dairy calves being taken from their mothers. Now, anyone's experienced that, when they say they cry for a few days, they really mean they do that non-stop. They cry and they cry and they cry and they cry for 30 hours, and then they all stop at once. It's the most awful situation. And of course, it doesn't stop there. It goes throughout their whole life, as it would for any mother. So, we came back to Australia, and my lovely partner said, it can't just be New Zealand pair. We need to look further. And so he went and got all the videos out on all the different types of animals. We had to sit down and watch the whole lot. It was totally traumatized, like most people. We can't eat for the next three months. And um, we all became vegan on the spot, including the dogs. But my question is, how is it possible that I went for 30 years so traumatized by the abattoir information? But it actually is a good experience for us because we realized that we're not there trying to sometimes deliberately push it away, we're actually willfully ignorant and the whole system as we know it is skewed in that direction. So I'm pleased to say that when I became a vegan, I also became an activist. So in the last 10 years, I feel I've come into my life's work. So that was a quick little thing. Um, but as I started speaking out and speaking at rallies, I got involved in live exports and factory farming particularly, um, people started to, to contact me and say, you're a psychologist, I could never speak to a non-vegan because you know, they wouldn't understand me. They would have to be vegan. If they're not, they're psychopaths, you know? Which may or may not be true. Um, and so I, I called myself a vegan psychologist. And I then suddenly realized that all the experiences people were telling me about was what I was and had been experienced. A 
very deep anguish. And what I was scarily starting to find is doctors and psychiatrists sending people to me that they said had eating disorders, because they're not eating the normal Australian fare. They had social adjustment disorders because they're not sitting with their family and they're upsetting the family routine and tradition. And most scarily, psychiatrists saying that vegans are self-harmers. The reason we go and look at those videos is we have low self-esteem and we're trying to traumatize ourselves. Now, that is pretty shocking because we know arm in arm with psychiatry is the medical authorities, which means there'll soon be a drug to stamp out compassion. So I knew I wanted to take these guys on and girls <laughs> um, to actually say what it wasn't before they started to stamp that down and it would be in the psychiatric bibles and some poor traumatized vegan particularly very young vegans under their parents, for instance, could be medicalized out of this to dump them down. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Okay, um, and so I came up with the word dystopia. Okay, um, so what is dystopia? Um, firstly, is the fact that you wake up one day, of course, and you find out about what is going on in the world. The systematized cruelty towards animals. Okay, everything you then believe to kind of be true, um, it suddenly isn't, of course. It's almost, everybody seen The Matrix? You take the red tablet and you wake up one day and everything has changed. You don't, cannot walk down the road in the same way without seeing the things that we all see that before you didn't. To much to my shame, I remember back in the early 90s wearing a collar with fur on it. What was I thinking? I certainly wasn't thinking the animal had been killed for that. That willful ignorance, okay, is, okay, everything's changed. And the thing is, though, you start, I'll give you a definition in a moment. You then start to tell people, and they say, don't be silly. You know, don't tell me what to do. The government would never allow it. We've always eaten this. Don't you know we're top of the food chain? All the nonsense, we've heard it all, okay? Um, and you say, well, can you just see this video? Oh, no, I don't want to see that. Or if we do, you know, that's just how it is. I'm sorry, we're brought up to do this. And um, you've got a trance-like collusion with a dark reality that people don't even know they're part of, okay? Um, but then it gets worse. Because then you say, well, if I didn't know about all this stuff going on, what about pharmaceuticals? What about education? What about military? What about politicians? Everything I believe. And then you tell people, and what do they say? They say, you're a conspiracist. You're a conspiracy theorist. Oh, really? Don't be silly. You honestly think the government's not there in a paternalistic way to look after us? I never thought that anyway, but it's... Um, okay, so what happens is, is we ask ourselves, how deep is the rabbit hole? Because our trauma is obviously key to being vegan, which is the philosophy of the non-use and non-exploitation of animals, is we suddenly then ask these questions. We go through this whole thing and everything, and a lot of the speakers here mention that. How deep is the rabbit hole? So the definition I've given here, and I've just spelled it out for us, Okay, sound familiar? <laughs> All right, so it's knowing about the systematized cruelty towards animals. We then tell other people, and this trance-like collusion with a dystopian and dark reality, they don't even know they're part of, okay? And they don't even know how deep that rabbit hole goes. And then we start to question everything, and then you're a conspiracy theorist. What a wonderful word that's been given to stop people. All right, give me a little bit of background. Is this okay first, okay? Now, so, some of the emotional reactions, and I'm going to get you to look at your dystopia in a moment, <laughs> okay? So with that definition, by the way, does anybody suffer from that or have suffered or found a way through? Lovely, great. Not lovely, but you know. <laughs> okay, these were some of the reactions that my clients and my colleagues and friends and I was talking about. I've experienced all of these. I'm a psychologist with a mental illness. Okay? I've been depressed, I've been anxious, I've been suicidal at the madness of our species. Okay? And, um, but all of these were the sort of things that people were telling me. And so I spent 10 years really researching vegans, gathering data, either through one-to-one -one situations or did a very large survey. These are some of the... Um, here we go. Is it moving? Oh, it's going to be naughty. I think it was doing this earlier. That's right. Okay, I then did a survey um, of about 1,800 people, self-selected around the world, and these were just some of the findings. 83% said they had experienced dystopia since becoming vegan, 59% said they were only the only one in the family, and 63% said the only way really 
is to assuage that sort of sense of despair is to be around other vegans. Okay? And um, who's the only vegan in their family? It sounds like Little Britain, doesn't it? Oh, he's the only gay in the village. <laughs> the only vegan in the family. <laughs> watch the videos, those awful videos, unless I'm in the presence of other people. I, I really find it very difficult to watch this stuff, and I know a lot of people are there. When we know we're with other people, we're part of the solution, it's become a lot easier. So these were some of the findings. Um, large number, hey? These were some of the symptoms, and I've sort of said it a little bit earlier, but these are common psychological terms given to, you know, this um, anger, depression, of course, but to a stage where some people never navigate out of this. Okay? And we've got to learn to do that. And my experience is it's only by taking massive action that we transmute that into positive change. Okay? Post-traumatic stress is a huge one, particularly when people have come very close to the victims, meet the victims, is flashbacks, nightmares. Um, I'm surprised there's not more self-harm, physical harm. There's certainly more alcoholism. Okay? But of course, when you're working beyond something of yourself, you know, you don't, some people don't even allow themselves, they want to be part of the other, transmute it to something else. But, you know, of course, these sort of things, we don't have solutions in ways, as Sean Monson said to me last year, did Earthlings, as you know, you've got to find a way to filter it through your body. Okay? It's never going to be okay, this stuff, what we know. And so we've got to find, I'm going to hopefully come up, share some of the things I've, I've looked at there. Anybody had any of those? Okay, right. Now, the animals do not need us to be hopeless, and there's a lot of reason why we don't need to be. I asked yesterday in the opening talk, who here believes in our lifetime we will see a vegan world? Excellent. By the end of this talk, I want you all to put your hands up. Okay, why don't we think there's going to be a vegan world? Why the people that didn't put their hands up, what sort of typical things, why are you not so helpful? Please. Human nature, okay. No faith, okay. Gentleman here. Sorry. The corporations are too powerful, okay. People selfishness. Right, money talks. That's right. Greed. Yeah, we see it all around us. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. Oh, sure. So you've got all this stuff in front of us. Okay. And you're not one of the people. You put your hand up. Well, why, um, James? Why are we? You're saying as I put my hand up, we're going to see a big. I believe that if we all work in solidarity, we'll. Um, dissuade the social manipulation and indoctrination towards the dialogue of speciesism and I believe that humans have an innate power and we'll be able to use that power to create something better. Don't we feel different when we hear that? When we, I mean, we've all been to the other place as well. And there were some other people that put their hand up. You put your hand up, please. Um, look, I guess, uh, you know, I'm a sort of a glasses half full kind of a girl as opposed to glasses half empty. And, uh, you know, I've only been vegan for nine months, plant based for two and a half years, and I've seen the extraordinary increase in just nine months, to be honest. And so I'm just, you know, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that just if we keep all pushing forward individually, um, doing the most that we can do as individuals and then collectively, and that's what I mean, um, that we'll, yeah, we'll make massive progress. Absolutely. Well, thank you, yeah. So, I want us all putting our hand up at the end, not because we all just want to pat each other on the back. I'm gonna share some really cool stuff with us. The reason you're experiencing what you have, and we do see an utter level of consumerism and greed, and most people live lives of quiet desperation. People are not happy, it's not sustainable, nine out of 10 people don't like going to work. It's not working, okay? The human species has amused itself, amused itself to death, okay? It's, it's going that way. The reality is, I don't believe we're gonna wake everybody up through consciousness, but I actually think most people are going to follow. And I'm going to share some very interesting stuff with you that at the end that you're going to go, oh, I hope you are. Because if I didn't think there was going to be a vegan world, I'm not sure I would get up in the morning. Okay? So I think in terms of your comment, um, they're not necessarily going to get around the table, from my opinion. 
it's an opinion, um, and come into this awareness in the same way. But when there is a critical tipping point, as there is with every social justice movement, people often move along and it tips, uh, or their behavior changes. Always remember, people don't put recycling in the recycling bin because they're environmentalists. They do it because that's what we do. All right, nobody thinks about it, yes? Okay, so let's keep that, you know, I'm not, we just got two sides of the argument, but be nice if we were hopeful, it also does something different, which actually starts to re resonate energetically with what's going on. All right, okay, now. so, now, just this is my little background bit. So, is if we're not addressing our dystopia, this is the sort of thing we can, now, you've all seen friends and colleagues, I imagine. Some of the worst cases I saw is really a theme, where, where people um, don't come and get out of their clothes for two weeks. They're hosting on call, they don't take their shoes off because they get a call for a friend. We're going to that figurine, we're going to this. And the people that work undercover, they know what this is like because you, you don't feel you can do enough, all right? But that ultimately, we, if we don't resource ourselves, we're going to get burned. And the animals need us today and tomorrow and the next weeks and months, okay? But you, I can, you can understand it when people say, how dare we be so comfortable, you know? And I know myself, sometimes when I've got a little ache in bed or something, immediately think of an animal that can't move around. You know, your world changes so much, okay? Doesn't mean I'm suffering from post-traumatic stuff, I've worked a way through it, but it's always in your mind, isn't it? Okay? So, so what can we do about it is the key thing. Those three elements I talked about is this anguish within, the physiological changes within us. I'm gonna look at that area first, and we'll look at the other two, the family issues, the communication, and also the wider thing. I feel I'm doing a lot of speaking at the beginning, forgive me, and we'll, we'll be working on that. Okay, so let's have a look at this self-awareness and self-care, all right? But let's see where we are at the moment, and I know I've asked generally these questions. I want us to do a little exercise with the person next to us, all right? Now, it's not everybody put their hands up, so, you know, just the burden of knowing, knowing about these things, knowing, um, and I'm primarily coming from an animal rights campaigning point because to me that's what re veganism is, okay? But you know, it has obviously implications hugely for people's health and our environment and Mother Earth and etc. So, and it's all these elements coming together. But I want you to turn to the person next to you and just have a little thing is, if, you know, what is it that triggers you when you walk down through the shopping mall, you know? Um, or you're with your family or you're in the workplace. What is it that triggers that sense of, oh my God, are we ever gonna find a vegan world? Or, you know, really, do I have to live with people that are so selfish? I want you just to talk to the person next to you. We'll just get a bit of a temperature of this, because I'm also going to feel how you feel when you start talking about that. Is that okay? Can we do that? I'd love to have you all in small groups. We're in a, quite a big group here. All right, fantastic. So find someone, if you're on your own, you know, your new best friend. Move if you need to, Norbert. <laughs> Please don't talk to someone. Okay, lovely people. 
difficult. Okay, we'll do a series of exercises, you'll stay with it, and then you can come back to the same person. Is what sort of thing triggers? Just let's get a bit of a temperature going in the room, sort of thing. When you present the data to someone and they willfully ignore it, so they'll say like, nah, I don't care. You present them with everything, they're like, nah, I don't care, and they shove the bacon in their mouth, it's just... All those techniques, no ways, or when did you stop caring, or what's it like to be, you know, and it, but some people are so willfully ignorant, um, and is it because they're terrible people? We'll talk about that later. Somebody at the back there, we, I could keep sending this back, or you could just project your uh, voice. Yeah, I speak loudly. <laughs> um, we talked, we discussed, um, being around very close family and friends, who, um, you know, love to hear it, but yeah, you have to watch some, you know, if they, um, family situations, occasions, birthdays, that kind of thing. Yeah, so otherwise reasonable, lovely people, yeah. but they still yeah, see them be part of the, the, yeah. this, this problem. Okay, what other things are we looking at? So I work for a not-for-profit environmental organisation and we have corporate groups that come out with us and pay to do tree planting activity and we'll put on a barbecue for them with meat and it, it hurts me to my core and no one else in my work seems to understand why. <laughs> That's right, so they're even in that genre, they're doing good things, they're doing the environment, they haven't seen conspiracy. Um, there's, I think this lady, there's a lot of money attached to this, grants and you know why a lot of people want to change. But yep, willful ignorance, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, I find seeing um, a sausage sizzle, you know, outside Bunnings, but particularly so um, often for breast cancer. Yes. And I think to myself, don't know about, you know, what sausages contain and how harmful they are. Yeah. You know, it just seems to be... It's right. It's, it's criminal, isn't it? It's uh, absolutely. So those connections. Why don't people look around and say, look, people are so sick. There must be something I'm doing. But no, no. It's just, you get old. That's what you feel like, isn't it? Trying to get <laughs> okay. So anybody got any new ones to that sort of thing? Please. Funny? I'm actually not sure I have to anymore. Yep. It's permanently there. Like it's like a permanently buzzing undercurrent of fuck me. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah. just, it doesn't go away now, it doesn't get triggered. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's quite provocative. Yeah, exactly. So it is always the gentleman at the back. Uh, I think one of my largest triggers would be around Australia Day. I mean, Australia Day, Invasion Day, whatever you like to call it, is already a loaded day already. And then you um, look into the, the, you know, if you don't eat lamb, you're not Australian, you're not masculine, you're you know, less than campaigns that they throw around every year. And I think associating slaughter with, I guess, national identity or masculinity is a pretty toxic and abhorrent act. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's used So as many a, layers there, isn't it? Yeah. That's probably my biggest one. Yeah, and also um, racism and, and, you know, invasion day and all this stuff we have to go through. Nithi, very quickly. Sorry, in house fighting. In house fighting, yeah. Now, um, who came to Seb's talk? Is Seb here? He was here. Seb Alex's talk about in fighting. Now, this is another, this is part of our dystopia too. Surely we're all on the same side. Surely we can just, you know, overcome our differences and whatever. Now, We'll look at that, we'll look at the second sort of level of the communication. But it is normal and predictable for any emerging group to have differences and to fall out. It's when we don't have a vehicle to have the conversations that matter and navigate through that. If we say, come on, we're all friends together, it's pretty underneath, and we're going to move to norming, which is the extent to which we have shared ways of which we're going to operate. And often people don't have the communication skills to talk about the differences with an open heart and mind, the sort of thing Seth was talking about. So we're going to touch on that in the communication. But it's, it's awful, isn't it? You think, God, we can't get on ourselves. We've got the oppressor over there, and then we've got each other we're having a go at each other. There's a lot of pain around this. There's a lot of lack of boundaries and attacking or in a blame culture and this sort of thing. 
it makes it even worse. All right, so we've got all this. It makes you not, not want to be here. Beam me up. Oh my gosh. The question is, is what are you doing? That's right. Absolutely. And you know, and in my research, and just what I would say is, you know, people said to me is, honestly, I would, I would, I want to kill myself, but I can't. How could I leave the animals behind? Okay, and so people even feel more trapped. It's like, you know, I could never live with myself. It's not about me, okay, but the, it's, it's all the time, as you say. So you, it's people having cow's milk as well, you know. It's, we don't see that, we see the bobby calf, don't we? We don't see, we don't see the shampoo in the shop, we see the testing, all right? So, now, there, we need to not only do this for ourselves, is to find a way out of this. It's because actually how we are and the energy we are resonating um, is actually influencing this growth in, in veganism as we're, we're seeing at the moment. All right, I'm getting people. I don't work with children, um, but I um, I have people in mid Texas or something. Please, can you talk to my 12 year old? Please, they won't talk to anyone else. They've become a vegan. They refuse to talk to anyone else. Um, can they talk to you? Okay, and you find that child who's living in the area where they even do slaughter in the local village. Um, the child one day is looking down at their food and they go, oh my God, it's an animal. They don't know what a vegan is. They did a bit of research and then they find out, but they didn't know. And this is what we call the collective unconscious. Do we have any social ecologists here? Do we have any psychologists here? Do we have, yep, yeah, great. We, you know, um, we have any sociologists here? No. I'm probably gonna go through all the different jobs in a moment. It's great, because <laughs> it's collective unconscious is where we have shifts in our society. It's almost an idea whose time has come. You know, The Economist magazine said this year, I don't read The Economist magazine, I don't know anybody. Any economists? No? <laughs> anybody read the, oh, there you go. It's, did you see The Economist magazine? I, I said, I don't read it, but it came up on uh, social media, and then I looked at it. 2019 is poised to be the year of the vegan, because the demand for vegan services and products is 10 times higher than the, the new non-vegan things coming on there. That doesn't mean that everybody's been brought into awareness. It doesn't mean they've all seen the documentaries or they're on a whole food plant-based diet. It's there's this shift in the collective unconscious that influences blindly consumer behavior, which means businesses respond. I would love it if everybody came in there for a reason beyond themselves, but if they don't, and the net effect is the same on the animal, that's really, that's all I'm happy with that, okay? So, but we'll look at that collective unconscious and also how we can use that and some of the practical things we need to do. Now, are you enjoying this? Yes. yes. Great, lovely. And I just, I don't want to do too much at all. I feel I want to make sure it's good. Great, excellent. All right, let's have a look. Now, these little issues and more, you know, the willful ignorance, because even before veganism, someone where you present the data and says, do you know that 98% of people that smoke will have a problem with it? My grandfather was 95 and he smoked till then, so I'm going to continue. You know, you get this mindless nonsense. You get people jumping to conclusions. You get people judging other people. Like Seb was saying it last night. You're sexist, you're racist, you're this sort of thing, as opposed to, hey, can I have a chat with you? You know, I know, James, you're doing some fantastic work, and yet someone said you said so and so. I'm just using to anyone's example, you know? Yeah, you might as well. He's He's having so much trouble with you, or, you know, is, you know, everything you do, it's a bit bewildering to me, I'm finding it hard to, can I just have a chat with you, because something that was said, can we check it out? You hold the possibility that you may be wrong, you may be right, you may be wrong. Either way, we want to moderate the behavior or the perception, but when we open ourselves like that, we are allowing the other person to go, oh my God, I can't believe it, you know, I did this video, and I was saying it rhetorically, and somebody took it, or whatever it was. Give other people, we don't like to be judged, so why are we doing it to other people? Have you ever noticed when you've got a problem, you're always there, okay? You've got, we've got a part in it, okay? Our perception of it, and, and of course we don't want that sort of behavior. However, sometimes people don't realize what they say. You know, I went to the Animal Rights Conference last year, a number of people didn't talk to me, because I referred to someone as male or female, and they said, you've, you've told me what my gender is. I said. I don't know you, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, we're giving a talk, you've judged me and a whole set of values, you know, please don't do that, educate me, talk to me, but, you know, it's that sort of thing, and it can be over a lot of things, okay, preachy vegans being one of them, we're going to talk ourselves. Now, what do you do to manage it when you're in a world where, you know, we're trashing the environment, you know, 
And 2040, if we're lucky, I don't you know in that direction, would have no sea um, fishes or crustaceans or aquatic life in it. You know, all this sort of thing, plastic bags, people's health, torture of animals, live exports, all this not, you know, corruption. How do we deal with it? Now, what do you do? Do we have a good old moan to our, our nearest and dearest? Do we go into a hole? Do we, what are we doing to all, because with the anger and the feelings and the resentment and the lack of hope, go a whole range of physiological things that we've really got to do something about. Okay, because we're resonating an energy that actually brings more of it. All right, and I'll share some new science in a moment. Can we talk to the person next to you that you've already been talking to? Build on your conversation. Just what are the, come up with a few things. What do you do, typically? Yeah. Conversation, you gave him a little chink of consciousness. 
And really, I call it the 10% rule. You can't, if you give people too much unless they're asking or they're standing there in the cube of truth, is you gave him something, you know? And stats are great, of course, because the person rightly or wrongly assumes you've got great barrage of information behind you. You know, did you know that 80% of pharmaceuticals before we buy an aspirin goes into the production of meat, eggs, fish, and chicken? Oh my God, really? You know? You know? It's powerful. Okay. But it's powerful to see it. That's right. But you did it with that thing. Just having that information relevant to what is being talked about. We want to tell them everything. No, we want to shove things in their face. But actually, that's it. what is the best form of advocacy? What, will the animal in the cage look us in the eye and say, you did well today? That's, that needs to be our criteria. Someone at the back there? Great. So we've got some personal things, communication. Um, so I was just going to say that one of the best things that you can do as a leader is lead by example. And I've found that showing people that vegan food can be really delicious and full of nutrition and even better tasting than those animal products just yes. reinforces those ideas that it's possible to yeah. maintain and sustain a plant-based diet. So showing them, not just telling them, and preaching the facts. And cooking, so taking things in. Um, who was it who said they took a nice cheese platter and a vegan plant-based cheese platter into work? Oh, it was our lovely Todd who was actually emceeing the, the other thing. And they're going, oh my God, don't you miss that? He takes it in. They go, oh my gosh. And for some people, that's the level at which they will change the behavior, but they don't necessarily want to see dominion. Okay, they should see dominion. They should be seeing what is going on in the world. However, <laughs> that's my shirt for the day. Okay, right, so we've got activism. We've got finding using facts, sometimes withdrawing and saving your energy. We've got showing people by example, cooking for people, showing that you're a healthy, happy, fun, interesting person who happens to be a vegan. Okay, now what about other practices? Who's doing yoga? Who's eating well? You know, energy levels, who's having some fun. Remember fun? Remember that one? It's good, wasn't it? <laughs> you can have fun. Probably with that you have fun. There's three dirty little fun havers just there. <laughs> right. Okay, but this is the sort of important stuff I'm going to be... Um, but, okay. So, it's partly communication, but it's things that have to happen in ourselves. Now, do we have any neuroscientists in the, in the audience? Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm not a neuroscientist, we're going to do a whip thing. Because how you feel, it, what happens in our brain, if we're trying to change something, if you've seen, you say, your, your, your dystopia is there all the time, it actually becomes what we say hardwired in the brain. Now, James, I think we've covered a little bit of this, but this has been coming to the end of the things you've probably talked about. Is that okay? Yeah. Great, perfect. All right. So, let's have a look. You see a traumatic image. Let's see what happens to peak that state. Okay? You see a traumatic image, all right? Stuff comes up on Facebook. Just when you think you've seen it all, something else comes up, doesn't it? In that instant, things happen in our body, all right? Okay, you used to become angry, okay? Serotonin, not serotonin, cortisol and adrenaline flood into the body. The biochemically, the body's in a fight or flight. Our blood zips to the back of the brain, ready to run and do something. It goes to our fight or flight, our sort of um, fight or flight area. Okay? We become angry, then all sorts of physiological things. We feel it as a sensation in our body within milliseconds. Anger. We then go, oh my god, another group, another animal, oh, gee, can you believe this? Or, you know, live exports. Really? They'd almost stopped it and now they're going, oh. As soon as you're in that, don't you feel awful? We feel terrible, we feel hope, we feel terrible. And then, you, you know, if you go into that little cycle, this becomes a little cycle in, in our, our neurology. The ugh in our feeling, gut reaction in our sort of solar plexus, we will call gutted. We have a, the cortisol and adrenaline there. We've given it a label. We got a sensation, we got a feeling, because we call it anger or despair or I hate the human race or whatever. We've then got a thought. Oh my God, it's never going to change. It's, oh my God, no, I can't, you know, whatever. It's, um, and then that carries on. Now, if we don't do something about that, it's called, it becomes what we call hardwired in the brain. James, what is hardwiring in the brain? Just testing your knowledge from last time. Uh, that's the oh, that's the hardwiring. <laughs> that's the hard piece of it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You told me you weren't a neuroscientist. No, I'm not. <laughs> you said you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right, exactly. What happens, this sort of trajectory happens, and then it gets repeated, because it's not only that image in front of you, you then remember something else. 
Okay, I get it when I see someone having ordinary milk. It looks unordinary milk, isn't it? Is I see the bobby calf. I don't see the milk. I see. I see a parent with her, ch her child, a mother with her child. I feel about the child, the baby that's taken away from their mother, an animal. So it's, it becomes. It's associated there. Okay. So it links us into other stuff. Then our guards down, and we can have flashbacks of this. We can. It moves us to this place. What happens when we've got thought, feeling, sensation, labels? If we were to take the, the skull off our head, you know you see a brain, you know, and... Yeah, no, 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 um, you've seen in images or something. When the skull is taken off, and there's this dimply thing we call a brain. Okay, yeah, like a walnut, a very large... Some people got very tiny walnuts. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds cheeky, I know. It's, um, is those little dimples are not by chance. When we do this little trajectory of this learning, it forms new little patterns. You suddenly learn to play the piano and you've got all these sensory reactions between your fingers and your motor skill, new little patterns arrive, okay? Happy ones do new little things. That's why we hear a song that made us happy, we go straight back there. And we're physiologically there as if we're on that nice holiday or whatever, okay? Remember holidays, no? <laughs> okay, the same thing happens here, and it gets deeper, it's like, you know, you're driving a car through the mud, and it comes deeper, and you get caught in it, and it's a bit like, this lady was giving us some lovely analogies, anybody here ski? We got one, two, whatever, okay, but we, I'm not a skier, but you know, we know what skiing is, you go to this piste, you got the sort of, up to the top of the mountain, yeah, and you imagine you've got your skis on, and if you were just to start running down, there's no way you could stop, is there? Once you started, whoosh, straight down like that. The deeper those little grooves in the brain thing, think of it like a ski slope. Once you start, you have a thought, you have a feeling, you have a label, you have a physiological condition, whoosh, down the ski slope, you're already there. You're feeling all this, your neurons are firing and wiring, and they feel terrible. You're gonna go, I'm gonna go through the bushes today. So you get your skis and you fight your way through the bushes, it's a little bit difficult, and then a new path develops. Okay, and then you go whoosh down that one, and the weather changes, the grass grows over the other one, and then you can't go down the other one. This is the analogy I want in your brain. If we keep doing this, we're actually going to just reinforce it. So even if you consciously want to be more positive, you want to believe in a vegan world, you want to be open-minded and talk to people, if you're in this state, you're also physiologically affecting their state, which I'll share with you in a moment, okay? So, the nice thing is, we can replace this automatic trauma reaction with an empowering reaction that puts us out there that says, I'm going to do something about this. And I'm not talking about distracting ourselves and being all like love and light, pretending oh, I feel better. You literally are in a state where you will influence other people's radio listen to you and their physiology. All right? So, that was our neuroscience lesson. Now, this is the brain, okay? Is, do you remember the brew and the red zone, James? You do? Excellent. Do you want to come and tell us about it? No. <laughs> Was it hard for No. Okay. Absolutely. Blue at the front. Now, colleagues of mine in Melbourne have um, done a lot of research on this. Is it think neuroscientists broadly agree, and no one's going to question me because we've only got one in the front. Is um, <laughs> it's like a few rock. <laughs> okay. In the frontal lobe there is where our thinking, our logic, our when we're trying to have serious discussions in Remember all those facts and figures for your brother-in-law when he's eating this, when you're in a state of trauma, okay? Getting upset when he's eating, understandably. So what we have is that frontal lobe is where we have logic and reason. Probably it's where our blood is at the moment, okay? We're amongst good friends, we're attending, we might need a little break or whatever, but on the whole we're able to think about this. When we're upset and we're in fight or flight and we're angry with people, our blood flows to the back of the brain. The cerebellum is, looks after heart rate and respiration and water levels in the body, it's, it's, you know, looks after our basic functioning. It goes back there, we cannot access our thinking and logic. Now, when we are upset and angry and traumatized by dystopia or other people's craziness of what they say to us, our blood goes to the red zone. That's why when people cut you up on the motorway, the person will go, they see road rage, they go, oh my God, I actually, I, I don't know what came over me, I just saw red. They cannot access their logic, their ability to manage those impulses. Hopefully all of us have got some ability to do it. Okay, it's back here. When it's at the front, we're uh, able to uh, access that and be logical and share things. Now, what is really cool, I, 
put all this on to impress everyone with your science. But the, what happens is that if you're angry and upset or resentful about the world or believe a vegan world's never coming, you're going to hover around the back, okay? And you're going to be in fight or flight reaction, okay? It's very hard to communicate, very hard to be in a place of peace and ease. When we are able to transmute this into powerful action for change, we're going to manage our internal states. We're able to physiologically influence our hormonal stuff, to more dopamine and serotonin and hope and this sort of thing. We're able to keep it in front. What is really important is a particular thing that happens, which James is going to tell us about. What happens, why it's important that we get our house in order, what effect will it have on others? Uh, I I'm sorry, um, it's, there's something called the contagion effect. Have you ever noticed when you go into a situation, people are angry and down and, oh, I don't want to be around there, it's awful atmosphere. Or people are high, you think, oh, I love being around those people, they make me feel so good. Okay, now, part of that is intuition, of course, but physiologically, where our blood is in the brain can affect other people's. And bear, bear in mind, when the blood's back there, there's cortisol and adrenaline. When it's hit the front, we've got, we're open-minded and, Asking people questions, and we're hopeful. Serotonin, hope, hope, trust, all these things, it affects us. It's called the contagion effect. The reason we know about this, and I'll do it very quickly, is um, who here had a favorite teacher? Okay, great. Now, only in the interest of time, because I know I've got quite a bit to get through, I imagine some of the qualities, they listened to you, made you feel good, believed in you all that sort of thing. They never pulled rank on you, they didn't have favorites, they didn't laugh at you. The ones we like are the teachers that make us feel good, they don't shame us. What about the teachers we don't like? Anyone had a teacher they didn't like? Oh, that's right, so, um, you had a teacher you didn't like? Who had one of them be over there? Who was your teacher you didn't like there, please? <laughs> what was Mr. Pat? Oh, this Absolutely. Okay. So with the ones that we don't like, judge us or rank on us, you'll never amount to anything. They make us feel that we're wasting their time. The ones we like believe in us, but sometimes other people don't. They also have a level of empathy and care and, and try to help us where we are. What we find with children, particularly between about five and eight years old, is when my colleagues in Melbourne have done the research, we find that you can train teachers to look exactly the same as me. In other words, we, we present exactly the same. Same material, all under scientific conditions. Same material, body language, train. But the, the teachers self-select, the ones that are burnt out and have had enough, they, not because they're bad teachers, because they've, they're tired of the bureaucracy, they're working in an area that's too challenging and the children aren't attending learning. And you have the other teachers that it doesn't matter, but they absolutely love it, even with all the bureaucracy and the troubled children and whatever. It's not a value on the teacher, it's where they are there, but they self-select. We find that even though the teachers look exactly the same, the teachers that the children, ones that are playing around, messing around, don't attend, flick each other with rulers, and they have very low attention spans, they, they're in with the teachers, even though they're all acting the same, that actually are really had a, oh, they're over it, they've had enough. The other the children over there, with the teachers that are self-selected as wanting to be there, loving their job, looking exactly the same as the other teacher, remember they're trained to do it, they're all attending more, they're, they're focused, their attention, their um, you know, collaboration is better. What we find, when we wire the brains of the teachers up, the children, the teachers that want to be there, their blood is at the front, and all those kids have gravitated to the, their blood to the front of the brain. The teachers that, even though they're looking all, oh, I really want to be here, this is great, their blood is gone to the back of the brain because they're really over it, okay? And all those children have gone there too. What is the implications of that for us as vegans? That's called the contagion effect. What's the, what's the implications? Hello. <laughs> You've just said it. We've got a hidden power, all right? When we get our own house in order by doing a number of things, and we keep our blood at the front of the brain, we keep our happy hormones as available as possible, our hope, our freedom, our open-mindedness to other people that have been equally duped as we have into this dark and dystopian world, 
We are going to influence them to bring their blood to the front of the brain. That means they can access thinking, logic. They can take critique without saying, don't tell me what to do. Whereas if we're trying to be logical, rational, use the nice communication skills, but thinking, die, you horrible person, I'm eating this. You know, we are not, you know, it's much as you might be feeling when we justify. Can you see it's not going to help? Okay, it really is a case that we have, and I love what you've just said, we have a magic power. All right? So isn't that exciting? Because what's happening is more vegans are coming into the world. They're not even interacting necessarily with the people that then change. We are starting to resonate with a completely different tune to do with empathy and kindness and hope. When, particularly when we're around this, this festival, is perfect for this. We're resonating an energy of this. Did you have a question? You're right. Um, no, I was just going to say, it's very interesting to me because I'm actually a teacher and I can attest to that. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. And I, I'm a good teacher. I thought, well, some, some days we all have our bad days. When I'm not a job, I'm like, but you can notice that. So I should have asked, who are you as a teacher? We have one here. Teachers? Yeah, exactly. Great. So lovely. But you can, absolutely. And it just goes to show, doesn't it? So if you go and there's members of your family, and, oh, where we go again? I'm going to try and be nice. You try to be like that. You've got all this baggage and all this history. You just put them in that place. And you think, I can get on with my friends. Why can't I get on with this person? We are hardwired and so are they. Now we can change our hard wiring, which is fantastic. Okay, how's our energy levels? What time is it? It's two o'clock. Do we need to stand up, move around a little bit, or are we okay? Will he stand up? Shall we just shake it a little bit? Great. <laughs> Excellent. Do you want to come in and see this? Do you want to come and have people move around this? <laughs> Lovely. So let's move around a bit. Thank you very much. Anybody want to come and lead the exercise? We have any aerobics teachers here? Any exercise teachers? Ricky, are you going to do it for us? Thank you. We're going for another half an hour if you'd like to stay with us. But uh, lovely. Come on, we got to do some of this. <laughs> I can look silly, so can you. <laughs> Excellent. Come on, um, come on, uh, Danielle. Danielle, start with some calf raises, guys. Get that lymph fluid yeah, come on. moving through. No, seriously, it's a thing. I'm not just making this up. Yep, lovely. Great. Get the Superman thing. posture, hands on hips, making us feel strong and confident. Confident vegans. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Influencing the world one posture at a time. There you go, there's no book there. Beautiful, great, lovely. Just get energized, thank you. Okay, now, give me this background because it's important in terms of, I want you to feel you've, the imperative of doing this. All right? Okay. Now, can we rewire our brain? Yes, we can. This is the lovely news. Remember the thought in that little trajectory that keeps going on? We can rewire our brains. All right. Um, how do we do that? Okay. Now, the nerve cells, the little things that are going, the little light bulb moments, the little thought, feeling, sensation, all these little neurons literally almost like firing, little electric bulbs going off, is um, when they no longer fire together, they no longer wire together in that little we call it te templated behavior, we break it and we gather new behaviors, okay, those little ski slope things are gonna be um, extinguished. All right, now, how do we do this? Um, we, we're gonna become aware of it, all right? Some people even feel hot at the back of their brain. You've gotta be aware of your self-talk. You've gotta be, do you speak negative things? Oh gosh, you can't stand these non-vegans. Or, is the world awful? You know, how on earth do we make jokes about it? You know, God, how did that guy get into be prime minister? You know, we do this, it makes us, we think it's funny, we're joking, but it makes us feel heavy, okay? Become aware of your self-talk. Become aware of, sometimes we also, we, we don't just want to go around with a smile on our face and pretend it's not happening, we need to debrief with people. The challenge of the things that are happening, of course. But we can then extinguish those associations and we can create new, do new neural pathways. All right, I'm going to do two things today. The first one is emotional freedom technique, and the other one is meditation. We'll do a meditation at the end. All right, anybody know what emotional freedom technique is here? You do? Yes. Have you used it? Used on you, okay. Can you? Yes. Is it something that you find helpful? Has anybody explained to you why they think it works? Yes. Tapping, yes? on our body. Does it must make us feel warm and fuzzy and distract us? It's doing more than that. All right, so what I'm gonna do is
Can we have a little go at this? This is a technique that I promise you works. I don't share anything that I don't use myself. Okay, I've known people that watch Earthlings and they do this all the way through. Okay, now, because when you, if somebody is in a, say there's a natural disaster, or a natural, uh, or a tsunami or something, and somebody's village has been blown away completely, the aid worker comes to talk to the person, and what's going to happen? Can you tell me what happened? What's that person going to do? They've just lost their family, their village, their livelihood. They're not going to listen, they're going to get more upset. I don't want to talk about it. That's right, they could, but you know, if it's just happened, those usually they're completely in shock or whatever. Or they may be someone who comes from their own background or upbringing or whatever. But on the whole, people don't want to talk about it. They're going to get more traumatized. So, oh no, I don't want to talk about it. However, their body, when they get a little tired at night, through exhaustion probably, they fall asleep, they have nightmares, they have flashbacks, somebody drops a saucepan and then they, they have this startled response. Because the body has memory of it, okay, neural memory. And they can feel, if they get that flashback, the physiological conditions of as if the first time they saw it happen. In the same way that we have the traumatic images of the slaughterhouse, maybe, is you know, they have that image of what's going on. How, so, however, we need to do something about this. We can't, we need to bring a person to a greater state of readiness to bring in their body into the whole program. All right? So when we're feeling anxious or upset or hopeless or traumatized by something you've seen on the news or, or on social media, there's a physiological response, isn't it? Oh, I feel angry or I feel sick or, oh, the gray arm, oh, gray hands, oh my gosh, whatever. In an instant, all those hormones go into the body and we're on that ski slope. So, we need to bring the body into it. If we try to just do our affirmations and feel positive, we're only bringing our brains into this. We, so what we do, an emotional freedom technique, is we tap on the body while we're saying certain things. That isn't a distract us. We're making contact with the physical body. All right? Because if I said to you in the moment, a vegan world, guess what? We just got a news outside. Everyone's become vegan. You're going to feel great. That's an external trigger. We get information. We feel great. We can't wait for that day. We need to live it now. So we would feel great. Our bodies would do it. When we practice moving and visualizing, calling on ourselves those, those states, and we tap, we anchor into the body. In the end, I can just be doing this here and I can move from overwhelm, which is a big emotion I feel, and I can just do this here and I can move myself out of overwhelm to calm and focus. Because I've done it so often, that becomes the tick trigger. Well, you definitely do a bit more than that, but you know, it's, I'll, I'll take you through the whole thing. All right, now should we do a very quick thing here? I've got a video I can send you later, but I promise you it's really good. Now, could you help me, because I've got to use both hands, and I've got to hold this. You need to put it in front of me, if that's uh... <laughs> Okay. So, so what is the importance? I'll just quiz you through it quickly. I promise you when we practice it. So give me three emotions that we typically feel. Fear. Fear. Fear could be one. All right. Yeah. Sadness, fear, one more. Anger. anger. Sadness, fear, and anger. Now, all of those words have different meanings for us, broadly in the same category. But your fear will be different than mine. I don't know if it's felt the same way. It has different emotions, different images, associations, stories behind it. But you choose the word. But all of us have some understanding of what it is, a consensual thing, yeah? So you choose the word, and then you decide, are you right-handed, well, you don't decide, are you right-handed or left-handed, or both, okay? The hand you write with, that is the one that is going to tap while we're saying certain things. I'll show you in a moment. Do we have any acupressure people here or acupuncturists? Okay, I think our acupuncture friends will tell us when we're going to tap on certain parts of the body, probably the chakras, okay? Or um, different meridians in the body. For all intents and purposes today, we're making contact with the physical body where emotions reside when we feel either happy or sad emotions, whatever. So, when are you going to do this kind of so, I, I, am, sorry. I am not going to get you all to repeat after me because we're not at school. So you're going to do it in your head. But I'm just going to show you this. So bear with me. So I just want you to, we've chosen fear, sadness, anger. All have meaning to you. And when you felt those emotions before, you had physiological reactions. Your whatever hand, I'm right handed, so I'm going to start tapping here in a moment. Firstly, you breathe in and you breathe out. 
Doesn't this make us feel warm and fuzzy? When we breathe in through shock often, it activates our sympathetic nervous system that is sympathetic to the fact that we're upset. When we breathe out, as we know in yoga and relaxation, our parasympathetic nervous system tries to bring us back. So, just breathe in. Just slow yourself down. I'll move a little quicker than we normally would so we can get through the material. Breathing in, up through the body, out through the nose. Breathing in from the bottom of the stomach, to the count of four. One, two, three, four, out through the mouth, like a waterfall. Five, six, seven, eight. All right. Then we start tapping. Now, have your left handed, you do it with the left, not right. Breathe in, and you'll just say, say this in your mind. Although I feel angry, sad, and angry, I love, honor, and respect myself. Although I feel angry, sad, Fearful. Angry, sad, and fearful, I love, honor, and respect myself. Although I feel angry, sad, and fearful, I love, honor, and respect myself. You're not trying to fade it or fix it or cheer yourself up. It's real. You take both of your hands and you would tap on the crown chakra, your head, feeling angry, sad, and fearful. Now I visualize like a dark gray smoke or something leaving me, what we call a visual anchor. On the third eye, angry, sad, fearful. Either side of the temples, angry, sad, fearful. You probably go slower, but we're just doing our send you the video. Angry, sad, fearful. Then we go to the throat chakra, where often our voice gets stuck. Angry, sad, fearful. Imagine that dark grey smoke, visualizing. It's making you present without distracting you and you're just accepting where you are. Come down here, that's often a very uncomfortable for many people, certainly where I felt a lot of grief. With whatever hand you're tapping with on the opposite arm, or I can pressure people probably say we're dealing with our spleen or something. Angry, sad, fearful. You take whatever hand you're tapping with the opposite wrist. Angry, sad, fearful. And then you take the hand you're tapping with, nice circle around the heart. Although I'm feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I love, honor, and respect myself. Although I'm feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I love, honor, and respect myself. And then last of all, although I feel angry, sad, and fearful, I love, honor, and respect myself. Just put your hands in your lap. Now, we're doing an exercise, so you may not have felt those feelings to start, okay? Just check in with how you feel. You might feel absolutely nothing. You probably feel calmer because it's allowed energy to move through your body. Okay? You might feel a little bit, you might sometimes bring up a lot of emotion, particularly when you're really caught in the grip of sadness, anger, and fear. You've gone through the thing, you've made contact with the body, the physiological has come into it. Now, you don't want to feel like that, do you? Okay? And if we try to cheer ourselves up and say, I'm something else, the brain goes, no, no, I'm angry, sad, and fearful. That may be worse than that. Okay? So, but choose how you want to feel. Give me three adjectives on average which would be more empowering. What would they be? I feel brave. I feel here and now. I feel brave, positive, and I'm in the here and now, present. Brave, positive, here and now. Okay, we do it again. We start tapping. Although I'm feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I choose to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Although I was feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I choose to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Although I'm feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I choose to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Just hearing those words have association with all those happy moments. Like even if you're not feeling it, you take both of them. Choosing to feel brave, positive, and in the here and now. This time, on your in-breath, I visualize a color, a nice positive healing color. You're not trying to dupe yourself. You're shifting your brain stuff. I promise you, if you practice it, you can shift very quickly. Choosing to feel brave, positive, and in the here and now. Let that color come down on it, a big colorful buttercup almost. Choosing to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. And if you can bring that state to you, with practice you will, because you're 
anchoring it into the body by touching your body, instead of just keeping it in the disembodied world of ideas. Choosing to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Choosing to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Breathing in and breathing out this beautiful healing color. Remember, I've got a video. You don't have to remember all of this. You take your tapping hand under the arm, choosing to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Parasympathetic nervous system bringing you into balance. With your tapping hand on your opposite arm, choosing to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Nice little circle on the heart. Although I was feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I choose to feel positive, brave, and in the here and now. Although I was feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I am now positive, brave, and in the here and now. This beautiful color coming down on you. You're moving your state physiologically and emotionally. And last of all, although I was feeling angry, sad, and fearful, I am now fully positive, brave, and in the here and now. Close your eyes, put your hands into your lap, okay? And just check in with how you feel. We're doing an exercise, you may, I, you probably feel calmer. I promise you, when you do that and you move from a state of disempowerment, you choose the emotion in the time, you go through the process, you make contact with the body. You say, although I'm doing that, I'm, I want to go here, you're resurrecting previous emotions that hopefully we have felt that are positive. Slow my breathing down, tap here, choosing to feel, and that becomes the trigger. Not the outside, hey, the world's gone vegan. This becomes the trigger. And I've taught my body to shift there. And I can go to that state of calm and focus, even though I've still got only half an hour to finish a presentation, okay? Rather than I wish I had two more hours, whatever. I promise you, and you practice, it's called emotional freedom technique, all right? Now, Anybody, how did anybody feel about that? Anybody want to give some feedback? Absolutely. Sorry, yes, contagion effect. Perfect, okay? So, you know, but you can move your state. Now if you say, oh, I can't do that, you know, it's, I promise you, because when you're in that state, and I even visualize the blood coming to the front of the brain, you are more physiologically prepared to deal with the torrents we deal with, to have the conversations with your brother-in-law, to get a bit, you know, and then just sort of give that chink of consciousness. All right? Okay, lovely. So here it is. Now, there's a little free course for you that has emotional freedom technique in it. Just take a quick picture if you'd like that. This was, actually, this was in Perth two years ago. Somebody took a video of the whole thing, and I divided it into some classes. So you can sign up for that, okay? You'll get a, 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 a access to that course, an emotional freedom technique, and a handout is there, as well as a lot of stuff on the neuroscience we've talked about today. All right. Okay. So, perfect. Are you enjoying this? Yes. Yeah? Learning something, I hope. Thank you. So, emotional freedom technique. But the other one, in other words, that's more of a waking state when you're in state of agitation. For us to break those little connections in the brain, we need to slow our brain waves down to alpha, which is instead of us getting all the done on the electroencephalogram going, this is all this busy stuff, we slow it down. That's where our inspiration, that's where our visualization comes from, okay? We're in a state of agitation. I'll do a meditation for you later, hopefully. Okay. All right. Um, anybody heard of heart math? Yep, this is our beautiful student here. <laughs> Her heart math, okay. And the Heart Math Institute, I really suggest you go and have a little look at. Did you know that common science is catching up with common sense? <laughs> okay. Science has become the arbiter of all truth. Where's the science? You know. Um, is, there's a lot of benefit. We've got these scientists here. <laughs> so I started to say that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, it seems to be that things, when we have bad news or good news or whatever news, there is movement in the heart before it is cognitively realized in the brain. 20 years of research by the Heart Math Institute highlights this. So when we say, oh, we get this sort of feeling, that inner, I call it that inner voice, that sense of rightness or wrongness, if we haven't got any other information, we often say, oh, I'm just being judgmental, or, you know, oh, I'm, where's the evidence? Because we, through our schooling system, have been taught to look at logic and reason as opposed to trust our sense of knowing. We need to bring that in as a, another little tool in our tool bag of awareness. Now, it seems to be 
that, say for instance, you're 70 beats a minute, your heart, the rhythm, okay? If we were to wire you up, someone says 72, over 15 minutes, 72, 71, 69, 74, it just oscillates around a certain thing, okay? And it seems to be that um, when we are in a state of agitation, there's greater variability, okay? And when we're in a state of relaxation or appreciation or hope, it starts to balance out. Okay? And the Heart Map Institute have started to look at the variability within the heart movement, but also where we synchronize our brain waves, our brain activity, brain waves, with the heart regularity. And it's now being used for treatment of anxiety and um, feeling calmer, being able to visualize the vegan world, deal with our dystopia, and go out to continue to do the work that is still very challenging to share. Okay? Now, can I show you a quick little one minute or two minute video on heart math? I think it is something we really need to, and you've got a, you've, you're looking into heart math, aren't you? Can you share something? Just um, quickly, I've studied multiple brain training. I've um, been qualified as a professional coach, and um, the heart math actually formed a huge part of that. So the coherence, so it talks a lot about the impact of emotions on not just your own state, but also the state of those around you. Um, sorry, Claire, what was the question? Oh, heart, okay, in short, heart math is awesome. There's a huge amount of science behind it. Um, it's not just woo-woo, it actually is, you know, scientifically proven and pretty incredible stuff. Lovely. thank you very much. Glad you said that. <laughs> okay, let's have a little look at a video, but, you know, we may not have to sign up for heart math courses or I've got a little machine at home. It's, I even wired people, I shame I couldn't bring it today. I wired people up where you literally take their heart rate and you can see them as they will do a little exercise in a moment I'll get you to breathe and try and synchronize the two, all right? And this is a, a simple technique we can do when we're feeling dystopia. Heart math tools and techniques really help you access the intelligence of the heart so we can make better choices in the moment and really navigate these stressful times. What we hear from people across the world and across all professions is that stress, anxiety, and overwhelm are, are really out of hand. And, and a lot of this is due to so much change that's happening. And the way our brains work, we don't like change. Humans do not like change, especially unexpected change, but change that we're not in control of. And as it turns out, one of the most effective ways to really reduce stress and anxiety, and even feelings of overwhelm, is to learn how to, to access the intelligence of the heart and shift the rhythms of the heart, which sends a different neural message to the brain. So one aspect of our research is really focused on developing simple, practical, user-friendly, tools and techniques that allow people to really manage their stress. So a lot of people, probably even today, if you think about it, have had a situation where either you were being told to do something or you wanted something, but there was a deeper sense or a deeper feeling that it's probably not the best choice. So that's what I mean by that lack of alignment. And that can really be a, a, a huge source of stress for people until they learn how to really get the alignment between the heart and brain, which is where coherence comes in. That's when the heart, mind, and emotions are aligned and working together harmoniously. Our basic research done here at the Heart Math Research Center focused more on the physiology of how the heart and brain communicate. Interestingly, a lot of people are surprised to learn that the heart sends more information through the nervous system to the brain than the other way around. And that sounds like some new discovery, but it's not. This has actually been known since the late 1800s. It's basic physiology. But this is important because the, the quality of these signals sent from the heart to the brain have profound effects on brain function, our mental clarity, even our emotional experience. So the brain is largely interpreting the signals from the heart to create how we feel. So this is why we focus on the heart so much, because if you can shift the rhythms of the heart, you can quickly improve brain function, reduce feelings of anxiety, stress, overwhelm, and so on. But it takes a different doorway, the heart. So the heart math tools and techniques are really designed to shift the rhythms of the heart, which changes the ascending information from the heart to the brain, which is absolutely necessary in order to establish a new baseline. And without establishing a new baseline, we really can't, it's impossible to have sustained change or improvements in our health and our emotional experience. So when we, are, when we get our systems coherent and have the alignment between heart and brain, that's really when we access that deeper intuition that we have within inner guidance. So we have a, a new, sense of clarity in a lot of decisions that can seem complex otherwise.
see, just some people talk about the overwhelm and the state of the world. We've got all of that in a way, and then we just throw a stopia on the top. <laughs> okay, but this is really interesting. So emotional freedom technique is one way to do that, particularly when you're slowing everything down. But let's just do a quick exercise that you can do in your deepest, darkest moments. Okay, is we're just going to, just sort of, you close your eyes if you like, but just become aware of that breathing again. All right, you remember I talked about um, the um, parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system when we're often in shock or upset or actually even when we're just in a state of where we are now the breathing in our heart rate does tend to go up when we breathe out it tends to go down so just breathe in and breathe out just naturally at the moment I find it easy to just trace it up coming up from the stomach up through the heart in the lungs and that sort of area. I want you to imagine now as you're breathing is to breathe into the left where the heart is. Just imagine you're just putting your energy there, breathing in. This energy is coming towards and away. Now I want you to move to a state of appreciation for the huge task that we have been given lovely t-shirts at the Perth Expo. For those who have been given the privilege of knowing, we have the responsibility to act. With all the challenges we have, let's appreciate the fact that we have been called, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Okay, we've got real purpose and meaning in our life because at this not only this time in our history, we are able to shift really global consciousness, which is what's happening. I want you to move to that state of appreciation 2019 is the year of the vegan. Moving to the thing, thank goodness we found veganism. With all its challenges, that we're not part of this system. Oh, we're doing something about this. Keep breathing into the heart and the head. Okay, and if I always do, if we were to tie ourselves in, link ourselves up to little and let's set the ground, we would find when we see appreciation, as we saw in those little lines, and you've got appreciation and you're moving into the heart, those, that coherence, that variability starts to even out. When we think about hard ne negative things, it moves in an agitated way with all those hormones and all that hard wiring and contagion. All right, so when you're in a state of agitation, emotional freedom technique is one thing, particularly when you're very upset, to move into this place and then move to the breathing, move into the heart, Three-stage process, slow your breathing down, knowing about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Then actually start to actually breathe into the heart. I've done it with a little machine, it's fascinating. Go and have a look at their website. And then you actually start to move to appreciation or gratitude. Or, you know, be around animals, be around nature, experience it. Because we're not little isolated machines in our head and hearts. We are influencing the outer world just by what we are doing. In the same way that um, Daniela Monica started to feel, because she felt people were calming down, no doubt it affects your, your brain coherence as well. All right? Any comments on that? Anybody feel that? Yep. Yep. All right. Anyone there? Okay. All right. So we've got a few little techniques then. All right. So, but overall, you know, finishing our self-care, I, I can't go through all of these, is you need to do some of the foundations. And it sounds so obvious. When we're under stress, when we're working long hours, when we're doing activism in our spare time, when we're, we reach for the heavy starchy stuff, I'm gonna go and have a bagel with cream cheese after this, because I've, you know, that's, I've decided that earlier on. <laughs> Is, and that's great, and also we need to support other people, and these foods are fantastic. However, have a high proportion of whole food, plant-based diet. Water-based foods, your energy levels are gonna be completely Drink a lot of water. Stressed body is more traumatized when it's dehydrated, dealing with this stuff. All right? Get some exercise. It moves the adrenaline out of the body. It increases pheromones in the brain, all that sort of thing, or release of them. Have some downtime. Be with other vegans. Go out for dinner. See a movie. See some fun things. All right? You know, sometimes the best thing you can do for the animals is to put the credit back in the bank. 
They need us well, they don't need us angry and upset. Please don't keel over, yeah? Okay, get social support. Share what's happening. Don't be afraid to talk about the emotions, but don't, what I call wound sharing, stay at that sort of thing. Help each other to move from that place to something else, all right? But, you know, we don't want to distract ourselves and pretend it's not happening. The, our reactions are real and they're powerful, okay? Have some wider interests. For some people it's cooking, for some people it's gardening, it's, you know, walking the um, beautiful children that are never going to leave home. <laughs> I have three of them at home, three rescues, okay? But be amongst that and, and allow yourself to feel those moments. It's okay, the best thing we can do for animals. All right, somebody you said, resource ourselves back into the fray. All right, um, and meditate, which I'm gonna get you to do in a moment, or do a short meditation. All right, okay, how are we doing on time? Right, now I said there were three areas for our self-care, okay? Um, is things we're going to do, all right. Now, is, what about the trance and beyond? What about when we have to speak to other people? <laughs> what about being, some of the dystopia that was taken in our family or our workplace or our whatever, whatever um, doesn't sort of work? So let's have a little look at this. Is, is when we learn to really communicate effectively, is imagine we come away from every conversation knowing we've given a chink of consciousness and you haven't converted them overnight or they haven't shown them what you want to see, but you know you've agitated them chink in the matrix, okay? Now, if we can match their energy and we're positive, you can keep them. You can't have these difficult conversations where the emotions are high, the opinions differ, and the stakes are high, lovely book called Crucial Conversations, is when you are, there's no rapport, okay? If you don't have, no, somebody tell me what rapport is. What is rapport? Relating, exactly. It's nice when it flows, isn't it? We know when we're out of it, it's all a bit sort of staggered and a bit sort of tongue-tied and or there's an undercurrent, um, fighting, you know, resentment, all this stuff. Blood goes to the back of the brain, heart rate's going out of coherence, firing and wiring, ski slopes going on, you know, reinforcing those things. We've got to have rapport. Now, can I tell you a quick story? Um, is I was in Christchurch recently, in Christchurch recently, a great honour to work for the, um, uh, run a workshop there for the Christchurch Vegan Society and Anonymous for the Voiceless. And I come back after then, I'm waiting at Christchurch Airport to come back to Auckland where I'm staying with a dear friend who works on kangaroo, is, um, and I'm there and the plane's late, so we're all hanging around and whatever. So, you know, I'm standing there and this lovely Irish guy, any Irish people here? Please forgive my accent, I'm going to try and take it off. Hello, my dear, he says. Okay? He said, isn't it absolutely wonderful? We're going to be here for ages. So why have you found yourself in Christchurch? And I said, actually, I've just given a talk. Oh, that's wonderful. I myself, I've been here all week. I'm a hunter. And the hunting down in Christchurch, absolutely amazing. Now, what do we want to say to that guy? You know what we want to say? And I said, and I thought, but he, we've just been having a bit of a joke. Do you want a coffee? Do you want a bit of a thing? I'm going to lose rapport with him if I say to him, what I feel, you know, what we know about hunting. So I said, I said, what's the best thing I can do? I said, I've got a job for you. He said, what's that? I said, did you hear about the, um, the animal rights campaign or meets the, the hunter at Christchurch Airport? <laughs> he went, what? <laughs> it made him laugh. Okay, so he's, when he's laughing, he's playing to the front of the thing, he's not going into fight or flight and ignore me. He's in a good place. His happy hormones are there. He went, what? Yeah, I've just given a talk on animal, uh, animal rights campaign and then actually what's happened? Oh, no, it's terrible. So I asked him lots of questions. I said, no, quite seriously, mate, you know, um, so what have you been doing? What makes you want to do that? No, I didn't ask why. Why do you do that? When we ask why, nice little tip, don't ask why. Why didn't you come to my party? You're going to give me a reason if you want to be friends with me. Hey, Norel, I'm um, hey, sorry, Norel, hi, Norel. I really missed you on Saturday. What happened? We're equal. You can, oh, I really miss your party, whatever. As opposed to, I better tell her the boss is late and I run out of money and my mum's unwell, whatever. Okay? Ask what, so I, I said, but we kept asking him the questions. When we ask what, we gather information. Also, the more that can come out of his mouth, he has to connect with it. And it gives me how much information he's got. Is he uncomfortable about it? Is he really gone home about it? Is he there with his mates and that's what he really enjoys? Okay, we went through all that sort of thing. I then start giving those chinks of consciousness. I can't quite remember the actual conversation, but I'm trying to get him to see the disconnect, to try and say, so you know, um, 
try and get him to, instead of saying, why would you do that, we don't need to. He said, well, these animals are invasive and, and they have a quick ending to their life. He's giving me all these little bits of information. As long as it's quick at the end, I'm not one of those guys that just does it for fun and leaves them. I'm a good guy. Okay, and what's the significance of that? What, what way do you think you're different than these guys? And that's getting more information, okay? And I move him along this thing by asking this thing. And then in the end, he said, oh, you're not going to change your mind or whatever. But he had to, it had to come out of his mouth that actually he was doing it for fun. He didn't need to do it. It was recreational or whatever. And yes, the animals felt pain. He said, but at the end of the day, if it's quick, it's painless, they actually are not contributing anything to the world, I feel justified. So where do I go from there? Do I then start throwing? So I said to him, do you know something? I absolutely agree with you. I, thought, I think you've got a point, mate. I said, could you do me a favor? I said, my dad's 95. Bit of a pain in the neck, really. He's old, he's, he's incontinent, he's costing us a lot of money, he's gone past his shelf the other day. Could you actually end his life for me? Because uh, I think it's the best thing I could do for the guy. Okay. He's, talking, he's a trance breaker. Obviously, my dad's a lovely guy. He's 95. He's adorable. But the guy said, I can't do that. And I said, and tell me what is the difference. You just told me he's of no, this, these animals are no use anymore. They're invasive. They've lived the thing. And we can do it quick. And of course, he couldn't do it. And I said, but I want you to ponder that. Because if it's totally, utterly, for nothing more inconsequential than your entertainment or traditions, maybe you need to be See? But I left and he left with rapport. Yeah? Now, I couldn't do that if I really wanted to have a go at him. I'd been lifted by all the fantastic advocates out there doing amazing stuff. And I was able, because my blood was at the front of the brain. If I had attacked him in the first thing, I'm a rude person, vegans are all the same sort of. This way he stayed there. So we're then in the queue, and of course I then said to him, would it be funny, I said, if we were on the plane you know, play for another hour? <laughs> I said, you'd be vegan by the end. Oh, no. I said, why are you so awful to yourself? Why would you deny yourself this great, you know, expansive? You see? So it's something about, we've got to match the key people at the level. We've got to have rapport with people. And sometimes, I didn't give him a load of it, but I gave him enough to get him to be uncomfortable that what he was saying was incongruent in what was his deep reason between my dad and this one other than speciesism. All right? We never know where it might go after that. Okay. So... This lady mentioned earlier the 10% rule. Don't try to give everybody everything. Just sometimes give them something. Somebody says to you, as they're eating a McDonald's, I love apples. What do you say back to them? No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Exactly. Well, what would you say? All right, you're going to say something. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, or you've got to think, no, you don't. And we try to tell them that sort of thing. What effect does that have on them? When they just said they love animals, okay, they're going to they're gonna get defensive. So sometimes we have to try something else. I, I tell you what I say when they say that to me. I really love animals. Oh, that's fantastic. I love meat vegans. Oh, I'm not a vegan. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, it's a trance breaker. If we can break the trance in the same way I did with the guy at Christchurch Airport. Hey, can I tell you a joke? He didn't expect it, because we have all been in, kept in the matrix. We know what it's like. We've had the veil lifted. Most people just go on. They live. They you know live the same life for the next 50 years. They do mostly do the same thing. If we keep doing that, don't tell me what to do. I was like a dad like that. I was told that at school. You can't tell me. They're going to get bloody minded and start saying you know because we've attacked them. Their blood zips to the back of the brain. But when we have a bit of fun with them, not in a condescending way. <laughs> And they say, well, what do you mean? I'm not a vegan. Well, how does that work? They have to ask you. Well, what's that got to do with anything? When they ask you, they are coming forward. Okay? And then we can say, so, and don't me to say what a vegan is. Ask another question. Oh, do you know what a vegan is? Oh, yeah, it's one of those fussy vegetarians. Actually, it's not. Do you mind if I tell you what it is? Keep, you want yeses. Any salespeople here? Yep. You know, when the brain says yes, it comes forward because it can say no. We like choice. Can I tell you, please? Yes? Okay, well, it's someone whose life is underpinned by philosophy of that. So when you told me you like animals and yet you're eating here, I'm a bit confused. Stop. They then got to do, don't do all the heavy lifting. All right, so here's some little tips here. All right, I'm also going to give you a nice little freebie here. Is maintain rapport. If you lose it, 
Okay? What happens if you get really fed up with people, um, Bunny, and you get angry with them and you really attack them and you go and you lose rapport, how are you going to get it back? You don't know how to practice it. Okay. Flirt with them. Flirt with them. Okay. But you know, we lose rapport, we go, oh, for God's sake, you're an awful carnist or whatever, and we know that it's all going and we've lost that opportunity. They then say, they shoot the messenger, refer to what you've done. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to have a real go at you there, and I apologize for that. However, I don't apologize for the fact that I need to tell you, as we all need to know. So you stay in your congruence by not saying, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it, let's have a nice conversation. I'm not going to apologize. I don't, I don't apologize for the fact that we've all been lied to. The word we is very good, then we're in it together. The oppressors over there, we've all been lied to, as opposed to your carnists, and I'm born again going to be in heaven. Okay? All right. Any born again Christians? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Nobody works here today. <laughs> okay. Be cute. Don't do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> Get them. There's a born again vegan over there. Is, um, don't do all the heavy lifting. Ask people questions. The Socratic method. All right? Um, is, is open-ended questions. What do you mean by that? How do you think that is? What specifically bothers you about adopting a vegan diet? Uh, how much do you know about what happens to animals? Oh my gosh, don't tell me that. I don't like it. What is it you think I'm going to show you? All right, don't let people get off the hook. I had a lady come to see me once. I obviously see vegans these days, but this lady came to see me and she had these boots on. They looked like zebra skin. And she, she didn't know anything about me. She just came to see me and she had this like fur boot and she started talking about them. She said, Oh my God, I really love fashion, I'm in fashion, what do you think of these? <laughs> I don't know who she'd come to see. And I said, um, well actually, yeah, you know, I'm not here to comment on your boot. I said, but you know, I actually, are they real? Yeah, yes they are. I actually know quite a bit of where they come from. I said, do you know? She said, yes I do and I don't care. Okay, what are you going to say back to that person? <laughs> That's what, it makes us, we know what we want, what do we want to say as opposed to what? Yeah, how do you feel to be pro animal cruelty? <laughs> now, if you've got rapport, you can get away with that probably because it's a bit sort of on the defensive if you've got rapport. Now, she, uh, she was not, I don't think, a terrible person, but she had, somebody had said it before and she was going to blank me and say something so awful that I would shut up and go away. Okay? But what I said to her very quietly, this is, whenever we lose where we're thinking, what do I do now? What is it like for you to hear yourself say that? Because you don't want to do all the heavy lifting. You want them to experience the onslaught of their, their words. Okay? Because if we just keep getting information, they shoot the messenger. Problems over there. It's Claire telling me these things. I don't care. <coughs> What's it like for you to hear yourself say that? Stop. We often give more information. They have to feel the disconnect. Because most people are not cruel. Okay? Okay, simple little things. So communication. So. Have you all got this free app, Vegan Voices? Vegan Voices, I'm going to play you a little bit here if I may, if that's okay. Vegan Voices is 30 days of free video training. It comes every day, or you can pay one dollar for something, I think, on the thing, app store. Is, um, it's 30 things, the typical things. Where do you get your protein? Animals overrun the world. Little video, okay? Um, I've got one with a QR code in a moment. Little video with a little communication technique based on empathic, active listening. Okay? That you can build up not only for veganism, dealing with your family generally or the public, things we should talk about in school. It's then got an area on there which is resources. And if you've got resources, videos, articles, links that have helped other people become vegan, you can add them to the vegan, the different area. All right? There's also, for all people like me, who prefer not to do it on a phone, prefer to go on your computer, it's actually available now as an online course. I've just got someone put that. It's all free. Okay. So can I show you a little video of this, to, um, if that's okay? This is me with very short hair, a little bit younger, three years younger. Now, often people say to you, I could never give up meat or dairy because I just love the taste so much. Now, before you have a strong reaction to that, remember that many people just don't understand what goes on in the production of food and the consequences for animals, people and the environment. So your job is to try and ascertain their level of knowledge. 
Maybe they're saying they don't care or that their taste buds are more important than wondering about the consequences. But often there's a level of guilt and people use bravado to try and cover that up. So before you react, your job is to ascertain what do they know about the production of food and if I was to give that to them, would they react differently? Or is the statement coming from a place of thinking that vegan food is bland and tasteless? Now if they don't know anything about the food production, you could say something like, I also like tasty food, but I learned that meat and dairy production involves enormous suffering for animals and ultimately the loss of their lives. Can I tell you more about this so you can see what's involved? In other words, you make a contract. If they give agreement, share the information without judgment of their current choices. Offer to show them more information through literature and films. This will increase their understanding. If they resist the information, in other words, if they don't care or they say, I don't want to hear any more, you can say something like, okay, what you seem to be saying is that our taste buds are more important than animal suffering and the enormous cruelty and misery does to satisfy our taste buds. Note the use of the word are, our taste buds, our habits. This minimizes their sense of feeling judged. You could say, I certainly don't believe this is acceptable. I find that people don't really know what's going on. Can I send you a link to this footage or a film, etc., so that you can see more on this and perhaps we can have a conversation afterwards? I also wonder if you assume that vegan food is tasteless and bland. Do you know vegan food is amazing and it's fantastic for your health? How does it get better than this? So they're having controlled experiments where people are just meditating in California, but they're not focusing on East California and all the wonderful things that are actuarially going to happen when peace comes. If we really grasp that, it means that the time we spend meditating, focusing, coming to events like this, living and breathing a vegan world, before it's made manifest, we are starting to influence the outer reality. Okay? I've got a few minutes left. I'd love to spend more on this, but... So, a conclusion. Our thoughts and our intentions, when congruent, affect our outer reality. But it's not just our group intentions, our individual ones. Okay, now, I'm going to share something else with you and show you a tiny 30 second video. Who believes we're going to see a vegan world? Oh, there's a lot more hands, wonderful. I'm going to give you another bit of information here that is really exciting, because we don't need to change everyone. I don't think I'd be putting my hand up if I thought everybody had to have a conversation and start feeling like we do, all right? Charles Hugans, I'm going to impress you now, in 1689, <laughs> because it's right about the book, is he talked about the process of entrainment. When two, he, he found, he had a load of grandfather clocks in a big room in Sweden, Switzerland, somewhere like that. And you know those big old grandfather clocks with the big pendulums? And he had them all because he was a clock person or whatever. And he found that over time, they're all swinging in all different ways. The time comes when they all start to swing together and nobody's touched them. So he started to do lots of experiments around this and lots of input. It's called the process of entrainment. When two or more oscillating bodies synchronize over time. It happens in physics, chemistry, biology, botany, architecture, engineering, and it happens in society. So at the moment, we're all over, the society is resonating here with competition and greed and consumerism and desperation and competition. And the vegans are over there doing that. I'm just going to show you some metronomes to prove the point. This is a, you can look at this on YouTube. These are metronomes. Everyone know what a metronome is? Click, click, click. You know. Yep, good. Now just watch them. Nobody, this is not a fixed experiment. This is over time. I don't think there's any words. Just watch it. very small one. Go, I want you to go onto YouTube. I'm sorry, I'm far my partner at home. <laughs> I was really impressive. Oh my God. I'm really convinced, Claire, yes. Go onto YouTube. <laughs> Look at metronomes in train month. There's a big part of them, almost this group here. It's like, and you see them and they're like this. And right in front of your eyes, you see them start to move and there's a little naughty one at the end who doesn't want to. And all of a sudden, you almost try to watch it, you can't change. And then all of a sudden, they all go up. That's the 
that's, that's entrainment. The most exciting thing is that it happens in society. So we have got to be in training over here. And if we're angry and resentful and being like the crowd over here, sorry, not vegans, you know, and living lives of not quite desperation, we're feeding that energy and we're in training over there. We've, what's happening over here is more like festivals like this. We're bringing compassion and kindness and happiness. All right, so we've got to work on ourselves. We've got to improve our communication and we've got to start training to a different tune. Almost got to go now. So, if we want to create a vegan world, we've got to learn to collaborate, because part of our dystopia is the infighting, okay? It's when we're, we've got to change that story, we've got to do some work on ourselves, we've got to be open-minded, and we've got to get rapport with people to also educate them how they come across to us. And, you know, we're on the same, we are on the same side, all right? We've got to, be able to work, learn to work through our conflict, which, go to events like this, go to people like Seb, help each other, the, the expertise is in this room. Examine our assumptions. Don't jump to conclusions about where people are coming from. We're very tempting. We don't like it when people judge us. Okay? Become a great communicator, get the vegan voices, help each other, but also be generous. Okay? Now I've lied to you because I wanted to do a meditation, but I honestly don't think I've got enough time, have I? Yeah, we're over. Okay. Now go to veganpsychologist.com. There is a you can download a meditation about a vegan world which slows down the brainwaves, talks about how we do that. And, okay, so you can get that. And if anybody would like to access the Vegan Vistopia book, you're very welcome. And I have an Overcoming Vistopia webinar every month. We've got the Minimalist Vegans coming on the 4th of April to help us talk about veganism and Vistopia and minimalism. And we had the Save Movement on last time. Okay, so together we can help each other. I'm sorry I didn't do the meditation. I hope you go and get some of the resources. Thank you so much for your patience. I hope some of that has been helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that was, was amazing. How good was that guy? Absolutely incredible. Um, well, I don't know if all the guests are here. How long do you need for the meditation? Did you want to? Oh, five minutes? Five minutes? I can't actually see. Uh, look, I reckon we might have time. Is the new speaker here? I think probably. Who, who's the Joanne? Joanne? Oh, she's okay. Okay. Well, yep. there she is. No, sorry. Oh, we're going to do the meditation. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Can we do the meditation? Fantastic. Just stand up for a moment. Would you? Five minutes. Just five minutes. That's right. Just shake your body a bit. Change your energy. I'm sorry there hasn't been time for questions. I am here for the rest of the um, thing. I'm going to get that bagel with cream cheese. <laughs> Okay, right, then just sit down. Thank you very much. Now, the meditation I can send you from veganpsychologist.com is going to be about 15 minutes. I promise you, who here meditates? Excellent. Okay. Who here thinks they can't meditate because the brain goes everywhere else? Yeah, okay. It's only because we haven't trained them. You're a meditator as well. Neuroscience, brain surgeon, astrophysicist, scientist. This guy's super vegan. Are you single? <laughs> Uh, oh gosh, he's on camera. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, okay. I promise when we meditate, we sometimes think, I haven't got enough time to do that. You know, will it make a difference? Number one, when we bring ourselves into alignment, that coherence between our heart and our head, we slow down ourselves, we visualize the blood coming here, we move ourselves through techniques into a happier state, we are more resourced to do the challenging work. Okay. When we meditate also, the Transcendental Meditation Studies, the peaceful cities, show us that it is sometimes the best thing we can do for the outer world. Alright, so doesn't that make us feel warm and fuzzy? We've got to visualize the vegan world coming in. We talk it, and we act it as if it's before it's even made manifest. Okay, can I just do a five minute meditation, four and a half minute? Okay, close your eyes. And just notice when you close your eyes how your energy goes to the inside. Any noise on the outside, just bring your attention back into your breathing. We've been doing a lot of breathing today, so we're breathing in and we're breathing out gently and gradually. And just tell yourself, I only have a few minutes, and I'm just going to bring myself to be present. And I'm going to make a bit of a commitment to do this, because it's important. Breathing in. Just bring your attention to the energy of space between your eyes. With your eyes closed, you notice that as you put your energy there, Breathing in and breathing out. Okay. 
and then just move with your mind's eye just down into the area of the throat where a lot of tension is often felt. Breathe into that area, breathing in and breathing out. And without any effort, move your energy of awareness to the left part where the heart is. Breathing in and breathing out. If your mind wanders, just bring it back. And just with your mind's eye, Take your energy awareness down into the lower part of the body, tension kept in the legs. Just scan through the body, electing to do this when you've got a little bit more time where you can focus more. Just breathe into that area and just take your, in your mind's eye the energy right to the end of your feet. Just breathe right into that area. Breathing in and breathing out. And then with your eyes closed, bring your energy of awareness right up to your heart on the left of your chest. Reminding yourself about the heart now. So you start to breathe almost the energy towards the heart. Breathe away. Slowing down. Bringing to more synchrony in that area. Wonderful. Now I want you just to imagine an emotion that doesn't serve you. A negative one. A limited one. Put a label to it. Just notice by even pulling the word into awareness how you feel a little differently. Because I want you to remember what it's like when you even just think about that. You remind yourself. Just become an observer of it. You have thoughts, but you're not thoughts. You have feelings, but you're not feelings. You have a body, but you're not all body. Just become a little observer of your own process. If your mind wanders away, just bring it back. Breathe into the heart. Slow down. Electing to do this more regularly. And the emotions that you wish to remove. And when you go and do the meditation, it will show you a technique to actually capture that in your waking moments and change that little ski slope trajectory that we talked about today. But I want you, in this very short time we've got, Bring all your attention back to the breathing. And I want you, in your mind's eye, to see yourself in, as if you're on a television screen almost. And you see yourself in there or on the film. Okay? And you're talking to someone about the vegan world that's been created. You've been advised and you've come aware that we've finally reached the whole tipping point or entrainment and the world has become vegan. I want you to see yourself in the image. What's your facial expression? How are you holding your body? What are other people doing? Are you laughing? Are you into, like at the expo? You're joking. You're able to wander around and eat anything. You see kindness. You feel abundant. You feel support, collaboration. You do work you love. You be around people, having great, interesting, problem-solving conversations about the things that matter. See yourself in that image. But most importantly, when we manifest that vegan world, how will you feel when a vegan world is truly with us more than two days at a festival? Imagine it's here right now. And most importantly, if you can teach your body emotionally what it feels like to be in that vegan world now, you are starting to align your inner world which affects matter that we know is possible and inevitable. So see yourself in that image and then bring it back into your body. Imagine the world is right here, right there, because it actually is. We've got it, we're in this enclosed space with other people ushering in this vegan world. Grasp that emotion, the fun, the support, the hope, the stories of what people are doing, people doing things beyond themselves, bringing their gifts to bear. See it within you and teach your body emotionally what it feels like to be in that future world now. So that before it's made manifest, you can be there. Play a little, from this day forward as we're going to come back into the room in the moment, play a little remember your future game. Where you talk as if things have already happened. And you, in this little meditative state, you chat with people and you say, Gosh, do you remember when we didn't have a vegan world? Oh my gosh, it's so long ago now, isn't it? And you see yourself, when you talk out loud, I talk regularly to people like this. And you talk about how great it is now, and how wonderful, and you're doing the work you love. 
and this, you know, animals are living lives that they're destined to live, they came on this earth for, they have their families, they have their social groups, they, there's balance in the world, there's sustainability, there's clean running rivers, there's abundant food, healthy collaboration. Talk as if it's already happening. It ushers it in. We feel differently. We bring around the hormonal states that match it. So just reconnect with your breathing and elect to find a way to meditate, whether it's through the one I give you or you find something online. Regularly do this, but most importantly, create a vision of a few, the vegan world you want to create. And the key, if we are going to align our neural internal memories with our physiology, you must teach your body emotionally what it feels like when what you want is made manifest. It's not a case that when you see it, you'll believe it. When you believe it, like the knee surgery, you'll see it. Take a few deep breaths, connecting to be the best you can be. Take a few deep breaths, and when you're ready, come back into the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Let's go and get those bagels with cream cheese. <laughs> Have a great day. I'll see you for the rest of the thing. Make sure you come and see the Royal movie.